Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the public lecture on ethics and animals organized by the CEHK Center for Bioethics. I'm Vanessa, member of the center, and today we are very, very honored to invite Professor Peter Singer from the Princeton University to be with us today. And for, to begin with, may I now invite our interim director, Professor Han Nam Lee, to say a few words, please. Professor Lee. Professor Singer, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this much anticipated lecture to be given by Professor Peter Singer. It is rare that philosophical ideas can change the world. Yet Professor Singer has done exactly that, changing the world through his ideas and actions. Widely recognized as the world's most influential living philosopher, Professor Singer has made formative contributions to the animal liberation movement in the world. His idea that it is wrong to discriminate against other species, just as it is wrong to be a racist or a sexist, is an original and thought-provoking idea that has aroused controversy and yet has been gaining greater acceptance in the world every day. Professor Singer has written 33 books and edited more. His books, Animal Liberation and Practical Ethics, have been translated into 32 and 23 languages respectively. Besides animal ethics, he has made important contributions in the field of bioethics in particular on the problems of abortion, euthanasia, infanticide, and surrogacy. Besides bioethics, he has also done important works on a wide range of topics, such as world poverty, effective altruism, climate change, civil disobedience, terrorism, as well as on more theoretical topics, such as evolutionary psychology, utilitarianism, and metaethics. In particular, his works on intuitionism and on the question of why we should act morally. He has also written books on Hegel, on Marx, and most recently, on Henry Sidgwick. Professor Singer is Ira DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton, and Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. He was selected by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And his book, Animal Liberation, published in 1975, has been included in Time Magazine's recent list of the 100 best nonfiction books published since 1923. Professor Singer was named a companion of the Order of Australia for his services to philosophy and bioethics. Professor Peter Singer is not new to CUHK as he was a keynote speaker at a conference here 15 years ago that celebrated the 50th anniversary of the founding of New Asia College. Without further ado, let's welcome back Professor Peter Singer. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Lee, for that uh, warm welcome. <clears throat> and I certainly hope that it's uh, not another 15 years that passes before I am back speaking to you again. My topic is, as you can see, uh, ethics in animals, uh, a topic which I've been involved with for a very long time, but still uh, is an important topic because although, as I shall discuss, there has been some progress made since I first began to write and speak about this topic, we still, to my regret, have quite a long way to go. So let's begin with where we came from. Um, and I do this because I think it's important to see that we have made progress, but also that we are working against a background which, um, at least in Western thought, is really quite hostile, uh, has been historically hostile to the ideas that I'm putting forward. Somewhat less so in Eastern thought, so since... Uh, 
we are in the East, I think it's appropriate to begin with some uh, Buddhist quotations, um, which are um, much more in line, really, with the kinds of things that I want to argue for and defend. Um, so we have this uh, going back uh, a couple of thousand years, um, which shows respect, compassion for sentient beings and for the welfare of all living things. Uh, and we have um, a, from the Pali can, uh, canon, we have this from the Mahayana versions, um, which also requires refraining from killing animals. Um, and the question that I would invite you to think about, but I'm not really uh, going to talk about myself because I'm not sufficiently expert, is um, what happened to this tradition in terms of uh, having an impact on practice in those countries that have been influenced by Buddhism in Asia? Uh, obviously, uh, these precepts, even if they are in some way regarded as uh, as an ideal um, are not really uh, observed by the overwhelming majority of people in uh, any country that uh, whether or not it has been influenced by the Buddhist tradition. Uh, and in fact it's curious that uh, as we'll see the Western philosophical tradition and religious traditions are much less sympathetic to animals and yet um, there is basically better laws and regulations regarding animal welfare in Western countries than in those that had been influenced by a Buddhist tradition. So um, let's start with the, the Western tradition just briefly. Um, firstly, we get in the, um, we have part of that coming out of the ancient Hebrew scriptures. And in particular, this verse has been historically important. And for most of Western history has been interpreted as suggesting that uh, humans have absolute, not only power, but absolute right to use animals as they wish because God has granted them dominion over them. That's not the only possible interpretation, but it is the one that has been regarded as most, uh, uh, that has been historically most weighty. So, um, then this tradition comes, uh, the other root of the Western tradition is uh, ancient Greece. And uh, here's Aristotle who has a view of nature as a hierarchy in which the less rational serve the more rational. And so animals uh, serve, uh, plants serve animals and animals serve man. That uh, uh, idea proved quite congenial to medieval Christian thinkers who were trying to bring together um, the ancient Greek philosophy that they had because they had access to Aristotle with um, the religious teachings that they also had. So if we come to Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, uh, he saw his philosophic role as blending Aristotle's thought with uh, Christian teachings. And uh, here, as you see, he refers back to the dominion verse that I showed you before in the book of Genesis to indicate that um, we have the right to do what we want with animals. It doesn't matter what we do to animals because of God's command. But he does also refer to Aristotle as um, a further justification of this idea. And so, um, this is a very harsh view with Aquinas. Uh, he's really saying we could, we could torture animals for fun if we wish to do so. It wouldn't be a bad thing as far as what we're doing to the animals is concerned. He later says um, if it means that you would develop a cruel disposition and therefore you would be cruel to humans, then it would be bad for that reason. But the sin is only in then being cruel to humans. The sin is not in causing pain to animals for no reason or for your mere enjoyment of it. 
And this view continues right up to the 18th century with the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who for him it's self-awareness, self-consciousness that justifies uh, us in saying that humans are important and animals are not because they're not self-conscious. Um, they are, Kant doesn't deny that they're conscious, but they're not self-conscious. Uh, but the therefore here, the idea that therefore um, uh, that they're there merely as a means to end, sorry, there isn't the word therefore, um, but uh, uh, that, that, that this cl claim that they're self not self-conscious somehow makes them a means to an end doesn't really follow from anything in Kant's philosophy. Um, it would follow from the fact that they're not self-conscious that they can't be moral agents, but Kant is not, doesn't anywhere argue that if you're not a moral agent, you're not uh, an end in itself. And so there's a, there's a step missing in this argument. And since animals can feel pain or can enjoy their lives, it's not clear why they should not be ends in themselves for that, to that extent. But around this same time, in the late 18th century, we find uh, the beginnings of what became the utilitarian tradition. Um, and here's the founder of it, Jeremy Bentham. And uh, although it's not very prominent in Bentham's writings, it's clear that um, his view that uh, ethics is really about minimizing pain and uh, maximizing pleasure or uh, increasing the surplus of pleasure over pain, it's clear that, that that view does apply to animals. And this quotation is from a footnote to this work, The Introduction of the Principles of Morals and Legislation, where what he's saying is, and you can see this as a response to Kant, if you like, um, that he's saying the question isn't whether they can reason, nor, nor can they talk, uh, which might be seen as related to their being self-conscious. The question, rather, is can they suffer? Um, that's the morally crucial element, which means that it does matter what we do to them. It, uh, it is morally significant what we might do to them. So um, Bentham starts a, a new way of thinking in ethics. And in the 19th century, we also, of course, began a new way of thinking about our uh, common origin with animals, and that led us to think more about the similarities between ourselves and animals. And that came through this man, Charles Darwin. This is a quotation from his notebooks uh, compiled when he was quite young. <coughs> um, but he already sort of thought that <coughs> there's something arrogant about human nature, that we think that we are the special creation of some deity, uh, whereas animals are not. And he says, more humble and I believe truer to consider him, that's us, created from animals. Darwin didn't actually dare to publish this thought for um, another 35 years uh, when he had assembled a great deal more evidence for the view that he was already starting to form. And he then published it in uh, this work, The Descent of Man, where not only did he put forward the view that we have descended from animals, but he also drew extensive parallels between humans and animals. And these parallels are not limited to similarities of our anatomy or of our physiology, but um, Darwin explicitly makes parallels between our mental lives and those of animals. So he is insisting that um, we, there is continuity between what we can feel and what animals can feel. And you see it here where he talks about um, feelings like pleasure and pain, happiness and misery, and he compares the behavior of puppies and kittens with that of our own children saying, you know, we can see here similar kinds of expressions of uh, joy uh, and also, of course, you could say of pain. Um, so this strengthens his argument of the common origins, but also, of course, 
implicitly makes a point that fits well with the Bentham quote that I gave you before. If indeed animals experience pain in a similar way to the way our children experience it or we experience it, then why is it the case that our pain and our children's pain is very important morally, that it's wrong to inflict it, but it's not wrong to inflict it on animals. So <clears throat> that's a question that um, was posed. And I think during this period, during the 19th century, <clears throat> the combined influence of the thinking of Bentham and other utilitarians like John Stuart Mill, um, together with the Darwinian outlook, led to a significant shift in attitudes to animals and a rejection really of those very harsh views that I showed you earlier from thinkers like Thomas Aquinas. So let's move to the present time and in this slide I suggest what I see as the current stage, the stage that we have reached and when I say we here um, I mean the sort of mainstream view in our society, the view that most people probably hold and put into practice. So it's a less harsh view than the view of Aquinas or Kant because it doesn't deny that animal suffering matters, it doesn't deny that there are things that we might do to animals that would be wrong and wrong because of what we're doing to the animals wrong because we're causing them needless pain. We're not kind to them. So we encourage people to be kind to animals and uh, to avoid cruelty. But we don't give the same weight to their interests as we give to human interests, even when the interests are similar, such as the interest in avoiding physical pain, where we can imagine humans and animals, certainly birds and mammals, perhaps all vertebrates, suffering similarly from certain physical pains. <clears throat> so this is what I've argued against, this idea of this um, lesser weight that we give to the interests of animals. Um, <clears throat> so this is something that where the mainstream view and I would agree at least in, um, certainly in English speaking cultures and in general perhaps you would say except in largely in Spanish speaking cultures, um, this idea is something that the mainstream view condemns because they see it as taking enjoyment from the suffering of an animal. On the other hand, this is something that the mainstream view doesn't condemn. This is a standard practice for laying hens, the laying hens that produce eggs, uh, the eggs that, that you eat, if you eat eggs, um, they are standardly de-beaked. Um, as you see here, when they're very small chicks, um, they, are, uh, they have their, the, the tip of their beaks cut off with a, a sharp blade, and there's no anesthetic, and the beak on a, on a, a chicken is a very sensitive organ. Uh, although you might think it's hard like a fingernail, it's actually full of nerves um, because that's how the chicken relates to its environment. It has to be able to tell when it pecks at something whether this is a worm that it could eat or a pebble that it can't eat. Um, so this clearly causes um, pain uh, and this is something that the mainstream view does not condemn. Uh, Although, you know, you could, because it's carried out on a mass scale with many millions of birds being de-beaked, um, it actually amounts to much more suffering than the bullfighting that you saw earlier. But because it's considered part of the production of eggs, which is seen as uh, meeting a human interest, uh, you know, probably many of you have never heard of it, um, and certainly uh, there's nothing that uh, is illegal about it or um, contrary to the sort of ethics that most people hold. 
So I want to suggest a different ethical approach and I call it the view of equal consideration of interests. That view says that we should give equal consideration to similar interests irrespective of the species of the being whose interest it is. So, as Professor Lee said in introducing me, the point here really is that um, species membership is no more relevant as a criterion for ignoring or discounting the interests of a being than membership of a particular race. Um, we know that in the past people did discount the interests of people who were, for example, of uh, African origin and they thought that they were entitled to capture them and enslave them to meet the interests of people of European descent. We reject that now. We say, look, race has nothing to do with it. Um, these are human beings who have interests as we do and their interests should count just the same. We would say the same thing about if, if uh, men uh, disregarded the interests of women. Um, but we still don't do this when it comes to a difference of species. And my view is that it's no more justified in the one case than the other. In, in all of these cases, it's really an example of a dominant group, uh, an elite, which has power over others and which therefore uses that power in its own interest to disregard the claims of the others because it's not convenient uh, or in its interest to do so. So it's an ideology that springs up because of um, that being in the interests of the dominant group. Um, so, as I essentially, I think this is what I've just said. Um, uh, we're not justified in treating species as a morally relevant criterion. So, of course, it's important that to say that that beings do have interests, that other animals have interests, and in my view of what the re what an interest is here, that requires consciousness. So, if there are no conscious if there were no, uh, no consciousness, that is, no capacity to experience anything, no capacity to feel pain, then we would not have interests to consider. There would be no question of equal consideration of interests because the being wouldn't have interests in what is, I think, a morally significant sense. But um, I think it's clear, and very few people now would deny, that many non-human animals can feel pain. Um, so, if we think particularly about other birds and mammals, the evidence partly comes from the Darwinian evolutionary history, which I referred to before. Also, the behavioral parallels that were referred to in that quotation from Darwin. And uh, the fact that we can see that nervous systems work in a similar way. Similar nervous systems producing similar kind of behavior, it seems overwhelmingly probable that this is because they're giving rise to similar mental states, to similar states of consciousness. But this may not be true of absolutely everything that a zoologist would classify as an animal. So if we ask uh, that question in order to say, well, what's the scope of this argument, then I think you do get a diminishing level of confidence, I would say. Um, a diminishing level of confidence um, about consciousness. So I would say, um, you could say that with mammals and birds, uh, the capacity for consciousness is, is uh, certain. Um, with vertebrates, I think it's very close to that. I think it's um, almost certain. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about fish later on. Um, it seems that some invertebrates are also conscious, and I specifically mention the octopus here because the behavior of an octopus in terms of solving novel problems is quite remarkable. And if you haven't seen it, I, you might like to go to YouTube and 
Google uh, uh, octopus videos or uh, um, octopuses uh, solving puzzles or something like that, and you, you find videos of them presented with uh, difficult situations to, find, to obtain their food, and they manage to solve them quite quickly. Um, when you get down to crustacea, which have a more uh, less centralized nervous system, um, it's more difficult to know what's going on, but I would say there's a fair probability of capacities to feel pain. With insects, where behavior is perhaps more rigidly, seems like it's more rigidly built in, um, it's uh, harder to really, I wouldn't necessarily say there is a probability, maybe the balance of probabilities goes the other way here. And with uh, the simple bivalves like clams and oysters, I think it's probably not very likely that they can feel pain, although it's certainly hard to say for sure, even in that situation. And then this other question is to know, well, are there, is their consciousness similar to ours? Is it as, are their experiences as vivid as ours? It's hard to know, but certainly since in the wild, animals depend on awareness in order to avoid danger. Um, and pain is presumably a mechanism that evolves to help them avoid danger. It seems very likely that it is uh, as acute as ours. And the domestic animals that we used are descended from the wild animals and there's no real reason to believe that we would have changed their capacities to experience pain. Okay, so I now want to come to this point about as I said, the principle of, that I'm defending, equal consideration, is about equal consideration for similar interests. And it does not claim that all interests of animals and humans are similar. So it also doesn't claim that we must always give the same weight to any particular interest that an animal has, where a human might not have that interest, or vice versa, where a human might have an interest and the animal doesn't. So, um, I show my Princeton students this uh, photo of some uh, cattle grazing on an organic farm not very far from Princeton. Princeton is in New Jersey, in a sort of semi-rural, semi-suburban area. And, um, as far as the present moment is concerned in this slide, you could say that the, the, the interests of these cattle are fully satisfied. Um, they have plenty to eat. Uh, they don't have any predators. Um, they would be sheltered from extreme weather if uh, there were extreme heat or cold. Um, and they're in a, a, a natural social group. Um, so their calves are still with their mothers and they're being raised for beef, these cattle. So um, they are going to be killed, but um, uh, at the moment their interests are satisfied. But of course, human interests would not be satisfied as simply as that, even if we were given uh, enough food, protected from predators, uh, kept uh, uh, protected from the weather, uh, and in a normal social group. At least now that we have knowledge and awareness of a much wider range of possibilities, we have a different set of interests. So, um, you obviously can't, you, it doesn't follow that we ought to treat animals and humans in a similar way. And the most, um, the most significant ramification of the differences in interests that humans and animals have relate to questions about the interests that we have in continuing to live as compared with the interests that non-human animals have in continuing to live. So um, this is the question that I want to raise. Um, is it wrong to kill animals painlessly? And this second question is I raise for the following reason. So somebody might say, well, look, if you, if you kill these calves, so that's the calves are the ones that are going to be reared for meat and killed. If you kill these calves, then they're not going to be living this good life anymore, right? They're enjoying their lives. If they're killed, that's the end of that. So that's a bad thing, isn't it? And considered in itself, I think it's certainly a bad thing to end the lives of animals that can continue to enjoy their lives. But the farmer is going to say, 
if I don't kill these cows, these, the, the calves, when they get to the age where they would be sold to market, I'm not going to get any income. And if I don't get any income, I'm not going to be able to continue to farm um, because, you know, I need... Although now they've got plenty of grass in uh, winter when the grass dies off, I'm going to have to buy in uh, hay for them or other feed. So um, I couldn't continue to farm if I can't sell them. So essentially the farmer is saying, if you want there to be more cows enjoying happy lives like this, you have to allow me to sell them, which is going to mean that they get killed. So that's the question that I'm asking here. If they'll be replaced by other animals living good lives, as on this particular farm, I would agree that they do, is it wrong to kill them? Well, um, one could say, look, if you think that there's, if you hold to this principle of equal consideration of interests, then uh, you would have to say the same thing about humans. Is it okay to replace humans with others that are going to live good lives? But that clearly seems to be wrong. So uh, why isn't it wrong with animals as well? Well, here's at least one difference. comes from a British philosopher called Roger Scruton. Um, Scruton argues that humans have achievements and therefore if they die prematurely they are essentially um, this is a tragedy because um, they can't do what they would have done they might for example be looking forward to doing things later in life those of you who are students here presumably are looking forward to graduating from university uh, to getting a job that you will then be qualified to getting um, maybe some of you will be looking forward to uh, having a family, uh, or to travelling overseas, uh, a whole range of different things that we humans typically plan to do with our lives. We're very much forward-looking planning beings. Scruton's point is that cattle are not, and therefore the fact that they're killed, I don't know why he says 30 months, because meat cattle are usually killed um, more like 18 months, um, but uh, he's saying, well, it's not more tragic than it would be to be killed um, later. So essentially, this is an argument for saying that animals are replaceable as long as they're having good lives. And I think that's not speciesism. Whether or not we should accept that argument is, a, is one question. Um, but it's not speciesism to say that Normal human beings have a certain kind of interest in continuing to live which normal cows do not have. And that therefore does mean that humans have a greater interest in continuing to live. So the principle of equal consideration of similar interests does not say that it's equally wrong to kill a normal human and a cow. So I've gone into that topic just in order to help you to understand exactly what the rejection of speciesism and the principle of equal consideration of interests really leads to. But of course we still have to say, as I said, we still have to say, well, even if we're concerned with particular experiences, how do we compare them with humans? So, um, if we look at, I'm going to show you shortly some photos of animals in factory farms, um, I think that they, those animals lead miserable lives, that they suffer. Um, but how much do they suffer? How do we compare the suffering of an animal confined inside a shed in a small space with what a human would suffer if confined in a small space? Um, that's a difficult question. And uh, I think it's a question that would be really good to be able to get some sort of way of answering it. Um, but I've thought about it over the years and I still find this uh, a difficult thing to weigh up. And uh, another question that sometimes gets raised is uh, what about wild animals? What about um, their suffering? Is that something that we should tr try to do something about? For example, predators and prey. And that obviously raises the issue about is there intrinsic value in natural ecological systems? Uh, because obviously if you get rid of the predators you change the natural ecological system the uh, prey animal will um, multiply more, 
will eat more of the vegetation, presumably, um, and you might then get to the situation where you have to actually manage the numbers of, of that population. Would that be a, a good thing or a bad thing? That's another question I'm uh, just raising for you to think about, um, and I'm not going to try to answer. Okay, let's then look at um, the implications of the ethic that I've been talking about for the way we treat animals, for everyday practice. And I also want to do this in a way by saying, as I said at the beginning, I think we have made some progress in the last 40 years, um, but we still have quite a long way to go. So if we ask um, what impact do we have on animals, then I think the area that we should focus on most is uh, the use of animals for food. And the reason for that is simply the vastly greater numbers involved in that. Um, a lot of people have been concerned in the animal movement about the use of animals in research, in experimentation, and there are good grounds for concern about uh, the way animals are often treated in research. But the numbers of animals are so much smaller than the numbers of animals used for food that um, I think it's better to concentrate on the way we're treating food animals and put our efforts and energy into trying to change that. So you see here, something like 600 times more animals used for food, or I should say more land animals, and particularly land, I'm talking about vertebrates here, um, not including fish, uh, 600 times more than the numbers used in research. If you talk about other areas, uh, like the fur industry, uh, it would also be hundreds of times more. Um, even if you talk about uh, the pet uh, the use of, of pets and the abuses of dogs and cats, or problems about stray dogs and cats, you would also still be talking about vastly larger numbers in the food industry. So that's why I think that's the really important area to focus on. And unfortunately, the example of the cows that I showed you before is not typical of the overwhelming majority of animals raised for food. So if we move to the pig industry, and I know that uh, pork is a very popular meat in, uh, in, uh, in China and here. Um, so unfortunately, the intensive pig industry uh, confines animals very closely. These are the breeding sows that you're seeing here, or one of the breeding sows. So these are the, uh, like the cows in the earlier photo, like the uh, adult cows, these are the mothers of the animals that are then sent off to slaughter. Um, and typically they are kept in individual confinement for their entire pregnancy. And they're, they're pregnant for most of their lives because that's their role, to become pregnant, uh, give birth, then the piglets are taken away and uh, the cycle is repeated. So um, this is one such sow. No, you can see she's just lying on concrete. There's no straw or other bedding. Um, and here's a different system. Uh, where these, these ones are lying on metal slats. Um, certainly no more comfortable, probably less comfortable than uh, the concrete. Um, this is all done to keep costs as low as possible. Uh, if you give animals straw, although they will be more comfortable, uh, they will, you will have to change the straw now and again. So you need more labour to uh, change it. With uh, either of these systems, you just hose it down. You just... Uh, uh, hose the area and the, the feces drops through the slats or gets hosed off the concrete. Uh, so, it's, so it's less expensive um, and that's the, the whole reason for doing it. These sows are extremely crowded as you can see. They don't really even have room to stretch their legs. Um, they can't turn around. The stall is too narrow for them to turn around. They can't really walk more than half a step forwards or backwards. And uh, they're, in that, they're in that kind of confinement for months. Uh, the pregnancy uh, lasts several months uh, and they'll come out of it uh, to deliver the piglets and uh, then they'll be made pregnant again and they'll go back into it. However, this, this system has been banned in a number of countries and this is uh, some of the, the progress. It was in initially banned in the United Kingdom. Uh, then the entire European Union 
indicated that it would ban it, and that ban has now come into effect. It's banned in a number of uh, states in the United States. Um, but uh, it's not banned anywhere in Asia, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so it will still be pretty standard uh, form of practice. And it was banned, I should say, uh, particularly in the European Union, after a pretty thorough study by veterinarians that uh, concluded that it was incompatible with reasonable welfare for the pigs. Uh, if we turn now to egg production, um, this is how most uh, eggs are produced from hens kept in small wire cages. Um, here's a, another view. You can see that this bird's feathers have been rubbed off because uh, they're so crowded, she's constantly being pushed against the wire or perhaps pushed against other hens. Um, and the skin gets very red and sore. The feathers get um, pretty tatty, as you can uh, see over on the wings there. They're sort of getting rubbed off. And here you can see the lack of the sharp point at the beak. Now, I never explained actually the reason for that when I talked about it. The reason is related to the crowding. Um, you get more aggressive hens uh, and less aggressive hens if they're in a normal farmyard situation. The uh, um, less, more timid hens will run away from the more aggressive ones. Um, but in this situation, they can't. So the more aggressive hens will start pecking at them. If their beak is sharp, they will draw blood. Uh, once they draw blood, they'll keep attacking it and essentially you'll get cannibalism. Um, and so you won't have so many hens in the cage and therefore you won't have so many eggs. So that's not good for the producer. Therefore, the simplest solution, the most economical solution, rather than uh, return the hens to a more farmyard kind of situation, give them room to run around outside, um, the simple solution is to cut off the point of the beak and then they can't draw blood. They might still peck at each other a bit, but they won't actually be killing each other. So these cages have also now been banned in the European Union. Um, although cages are still allowed, but they, uh, they have to be significantly larger, a lot more space, and they have to give hens an individual nesting box. Um, hens have a strong instinct to lay their eggs in private. Um, so if you give them a space to do that, they will always go into that sort of nesting area and do it. Um, and uh, veterinarians and ethologists have testified that it causes a lot of uh, stress to a hen to have to lay her egg where other hens are around. But the standard battery cage, there is no option for her. So this is the chicken production, um, which is... Uh, Again, an, an enormous sort of mass industry. You, what you have here is the inside of a very large shed. It might hold 20,000 chickens um, crowded together. Um, these chickens are getting, must be getting close to the point at which they're going to be uh, trucked off, killed and sold. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a, a mass operation in which the food and water is automatically delivered down these pipes here. Um, so there is virtually no labor involved. The chickens are essentially not really supervised. Maybe somebody walks through the shed occasionally and picks up the corpses of the chickens that have died. And although they're very young, uh, a number of them will have died for a variety of different reasons, sometimes just because they've gained weight so fast. They're, they're bred to gain weight as quickly as possible. They've gained weight so fast that they're legs will have collapsed under them. Their bones are immature, uh, and if their legs collapse under them, and they're not within reach of food and water, let's say, you know, this one, um, they're just going to die from uh, dehydration and, or starvation. Nobody is going to say, oh, here's a chicken in trouble. Um, we better try and help it or give it some veterinary attention or anything like that. It's just, it just uh, wouldn't pay. Doesn't, doesn't worth it. So in all of these situations, it's economics that dictates how animals are treated, not any concern for their well-being. Okay, and as I say, the amount of space per bird is, um, this was done for the US, so it's, it's, uh, it's significantly le less than that. An, an A4 sheet of paper is bigger by about that much uh, than, a, than a quarto sheet. So the space per bird is, is less than one of your sheets of, of paper. Uh, just briefly on fish, 
Um, again, the numbers are even larger than for land animals. Um, and although when fish are wild caught, it's true that they don't suffer during their lives, um, they, there is no humane slaughter for fish. So they generally are brought up to the, uh, into the air and allowed to suffocate, which is a slow and painful de uh, death. Assuming that fish do feel pain, and I think we are justified in believing that they do, uh, this is a fairly recent book uh, by a scientist who studies fish who pr brings together the evidence that they do feel pain. Okay, so um, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions, uh, and uh, so I don't want to spend uh, too long on uh, talking about where we're heading, but I will just say a little bit about why I think there's some reason for thinking that we may make further progress. If you look at um, some indications, uh, there is a greater concern for animals now than there was even in the last 40 years or so. This is about um, the number of movies each in which animals were harmed each year. Uh, now, we're talking about tiny numbers here. It's, it doesn't compare, obviously, with what I've just been discussing at all. Um, but it's significant in that it shows more public awareness that the movie industry has uh, significantly reduced the number of films in which animals are harmed as part of the action. So that's a small positive step. Um, also, in terms of uh, the number of people who are not eating animals, we see upward trends in uh, the United Kingdom, in the United States, and although I don't have figures for it here, I think you could uh, include Europe, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, a number of other countries in this trend. Now, um, is this ethical progress? Uh, I think part of it is ethical progress. I think that uh, some people have uh, become vegetarian or vegan because they believe it's better for their health. Um, some of them uh, are avoiding meat because of environmental concerns, because of the uh, uh, climate change effect, but that's also an ethical reason. Uh, and uh, some of them because of the kinds of reasons that I've been putting forward to you just now. So uh, I see these trends as uh, signs of progress. And interestingly, in the United States, um, whether it's due to an increase in vegetarianism or uh, perhaps more likely to a decrease in meat consumption by people who are continuing to eat meat, it seems that meat consumption in the United States has peaked um, because there was, there's been very steady growth as far as the figures go back. These figures only go back about uh, 70, uh, less, less 60, 70 years, but you could certainly take them back for the whole of the 19th century. Probably you could take them back to the European settlement of the United States. And you would find that per capita meat consumption rose pretty steadily during all that period. Uh, the meats consumed did change a bit. So um, as you see here, beef consumption actually peaked in the 1970s and has been dropping off since, probably for health reasons. But for many years, total meat consumption rose because of the rise of chicken. Chicken just kept getting cheaper and cheaper because it was being produced by the methods that I showed you. And uh, so the amount of chicken sort of balanced or more than balanced the decline in beef production and the other meats uh, remained fairly similar. Uh, and so meat consumption rose. But around 2008 or something like that, meat consumption started falling. And uh, this only goes up to 2012, but the 2013 figures, which are now available, continued the trend. So <clears throat> I don't know why, but uh, I think it's something that ought to be welcomed, both from the point of view of reducing the number of animals that are suffering in factory farms and from the point of view of reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the livestock industry. But um, although this is a <coughs> positive sign, there is unfortunately a big negative when we 
don't focus on the United States or Europe or some of the other countries I mentioned, but we get closer to home, closer to here anyway. Um, and I'm sure you're all already aware of the fact that uh, as China has become more affluent, and I'm sure the same would be true for, for Hong Kong, um, uh, meat, per capita meat consumption has risen very dramatically. Now, I should say it's still, um, it's still significantly lower than American meat production, uh, American per capita meat consumption. Um, but uh, in term, because of the, the large numbers of people involved, it has been disastrous in terms of uh, increasing the number of animals being raised. And again, the overwhelming majority of these animals are confined in factory farms of the kind that, uh, that I showed you. Uh, so in terms of, you know, this, this goes back to what I said at the beginning, um, it seems that the, uh, the historical tradition uh, of, a, of a region and the, what it said about animals, whether it was Buddhist and rather positive or whether it was uh, Christian and rather negative, doesn't seem to have made much impact uh, when it comes to things like producing food by the cheapest and most economical means possible without any real concern for the animals involved. So I hope that that's something that um, will change in future as levels of education rise, levels of awareness rise, uh, perhaps as people uh, start to find that uh, the increase in meat consumption has negative health effects as well, uh, that this is going to change. And it's, it's important that it does for a third reason. I've talked about the animal welfare, climate change, um, but it is also causing problems for uh, the availability of food to feed people as well. Because, you know, sometimes people say, when uh, I show photos of factory farms of all those chickens, they say, well, we've got a growing population, we have to feed them. But in fact, those chickens have to be fed on grain or soybeans or sometimes fish meal. And these are food, foods that we could eat directly. And if we did eat them directly, we would be able to actually feed a much larger population. Or you could say we, could, we would only be able to, we would only need a fraction of the quantity of grain that is being fed to the animals to nourish ourselves. The animals just burn up the food value uh, of, of, of what they're eating in order to go on living, in order to keep their bodies warm if they're um, mammals or birds. Um, and uh, therefore, that, that's why there's such enormous uh, loss of food value when we feed uh, grains and soybeans and fish meal to animals. And then, of course, you, I don't need to tell you about the uh, problems about um, uh, zoo zoonotic diseases coming from factory farms. Um, you know, when you think about it, you think about that slide of the chickens I showed you. It's a perfect environment for the <laughs> development of new viruses. Uh, because these animals are in such close proximity to each other, will immediately, if you get something in there, you know, viruses will mutate. Uh, they will spread, um, and uh, <coughs> quite soon you'll have a, a big problem, as in fact uh, we've had with, had with bird flu here and in a number of other areas. And uh, I think we're bound to have uh, more outbreaks from time to time, and the worry is that they will be uh, more deadly and uh, will spread more, more contagious than the ones that we've had so far. So uh, let me just briefly say something about, uh, about fish. Um, we can distinguish wild-caught fish from aquaculture. The wild-caught fish, as I've already said, we don't interfere with their lives. That's good. Um, the killing in itself is, um, the, the killing is, is, is never humane. Um, there is the question of killing, of ending the lives of these fish, which are presumably leading lives that they enjoy. It's a little hard to know with fish, admittedly. Um, and the, but the, perhaps one of the biggest problems is the sustainability of the fish stocks. 
So we are <coughs> progressively fishing out the, the biggest commercial fish stocks uh, in the ocean. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a problem there. Now you might think, well, if we switch to aquaculture, we're not going to be at least causing the problem of sustainability. But in fact, when we raise carnivorous species of fish through aquaculture, we still have to catch fish in order to feed them. We catch fish, we grind them up, we make pellets from it, and we feed the fish. So just as with feeding grain to animals, there is a waste of food value. We have to catch about twice as much fish to feed. Uh, you know, two kilos of fish have to be caught for every kilo of uh, commercial fish that comes out of the aquaculture production system. And uh, there is good evidence of um, the fact that in aquaculture, fish are stressed. Um, the, the, the crowding and the confinement that occurs causes uh, stress to fish, although we're only just starting to really understand and measure indicators of stress, but uh, that seems to be the case. So <clears throat> let me draw this to a conclusion. I've argued that I think on the ethical basis that I laid out of equal consideration of interests, we ought not to be raising animals in ways that cause them prolonged and significant suffering where it's not absolutely necessary for our own survival. Um, I think the factory farms in which the majority of food animals live, the majority of those 60 billion animals we raise each year, uh, are such that they are suffering uh, significantly for most of their lives. Uh, this is not necessary for our survival. In fact, it's wasteful of the food that we produce and risky for our survival because of the potential for developing new viruses that might be harmful to us. So um, the only reason there is for doing it essentially is that people enjoy the taste of the animal products that come out of it. And uh, I don't think that's a good enough reason to inflict prolonged suffering on large numbers of animals. So I think that uh, it follows pretty clearly that uh, we ought not to be doing this and we ought personally, individually, if we want to eat ethically, we ought to be avoiding products of factory farms. Now, that still leaves the question here, what about the products of these kinds of farms where animals are well treated? And I think that's a more difficult question. And I do think somebody could claim to be eating ethically while continuing to buy some uh, free range or organically produced animal products if they really had good reason to believe that the animals were being well treated because the, those labels are not always enough to really indicate good animal welfare. But um, if you know more about the, where, they're being, where they're living, maybe that's uh, a defensible view. But um, uh, so this is the, the question that I say um, is, is a short life followed by humane death better than no life at all? If you answer that question affirmatively, you could perhaps say that eating animals from the farm like the one I showed is defensible. Um, but uh, uh, even if that's true in theory, there are some other issues that I ought to just mention. So one is um, that it's still an economic process. If you're producing animals commercially, in a competitive situation, there is still going to be pressure to cut costs. So, for example, slaughterhouse conditions are often contrary to animal welfare because the slaughterhouse makes its money by slaughtering as many animals per hour as it can. It has to pay the employees per hour, so the more animals it gets out of them per hour, the more dead animals, the better. Um, so that may be true with humane even the most humane farms, that they go to slaughterhouses that are not humane. Um, uh, that's more or less the, uh, the same point, I think, that um, it's, it's difficult to maintain high standards in a commercial system. And finally, there's, um, there is the contribution of livestock to climate change. So um, here's a study indicating how much you can save um, by switching from... Uh, an American diet, which as I said is pretty heavy in animal products, probably 
heavier than the typical diet of uh, somebody in Hong Kong. Um, but you can say one and a half tons of carbon emissions per year. Just for comparison, if you were driving a standard kind of car, uh, let's say a Toyota Camry, and you switch to a Prius, uh, then if you drive, um, uh, again, this is for American standards, so Americans probably drive more than people here would, um, you would save only one ton of carbon per year. So you can make a bigger, depending again on, on how much meat you eat and how much you drive, you could make a bigger reduction in your carbon emissions by becoming vegan than by buying a Prius instead of your uh, other car. Um, and this is a report from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, which says that the livestock sector is a bigger uh, contributor to climate change than the whole of the transport industry. All of the cars, buses, planes, trucks, ships, and so on. So it, it is a significant factor in um, thinking about what it's ethical to eat to minimize the climate change. This is just making the same sort of point that uh, even in the um, slide that I showed you of the cattle on grass, or like this one, um, this doesn't help from a climate change point of view. The welfare is better, but the, um, the, the greenhouse gas emissions are actually greater when cattle are eating grass than when they're fed on grain in a, in a feedlot. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop at that point because I do, as I said, want to allow you time for questions. I think we have about 20 minutes or so for questions. Um, Professor Lee is going to uh, moderate the question time. Thank you. So we have something like uh, 23 minutes. Okay, this gentleman. It was a great pleasure to listen to you and to read your work as, uh, as I've done before. Um, if we scrutinize uh, Mr. Scruton's work or Mrs. Scruton's work, um, I, I don't really uh, get it because um, it's easy to imagine that also cows can uh, look forward to their day. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's becoming warmer in the, in, in the afternoon or, and then they go to bed. And they can, you, as a cow, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a question of empathy, I think. I can, I can, you know, if I think, okay, maybe what if I were a, a cow? Then, uh, you know, I look forward to the seasons. So these are all things. So shouldn't the question be um, whether animals can demonstrate their natural behavior? Should that not be the real question? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the, the reason that this matters, as I said, is to try to work out what their interests are and whether their interests are similar to ours. Um, I would agree with you that I think maybe uh, you know, there would be evidence, for example, dairy cows, um, after you milk them, if, if it is an organic farm where they get to go outside, there's evidence that they're impatient to go outside and get back to the grass. So yes, they can certainly look forward to what else will happen that day, they experience with this routine of being milked and then going back to the grass. Uh, and I wouldn't have much doubt that they can do that. You also referred to them looking forward to the changing seasons. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think that's speculation. I, I'm not saying necessarily it's true, but I don't think we have any evidence that it is true. It's also not to the contrary. Yes, we don't have evidence to the contrary either. That's right. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it, there are interesting questions about how you could try and test these things. There have been experiments done with, um, I think they're a kind of Jay, a member of the Crow family, uh, where um, they are moved around from different cages and, and uh, they're given different foods in different cages, which they start to recognise. And that, that these are birds that actually like a variety of food. So um, they're given the opportunity to store some food in a cage of a kind that's different from the type that they normally get fed in that cage. And it's been shown that they do actually store the food of the different type from the type that they're gonna get. So it does seem that they at least can think ahead to thinking, oh, soon I will be in that cage and I will only be fed on those boring pellets and I wanna have whatever the other more interesting or more varied food is. So they store it there. So 
you, it would be interesting to try to do that sort of experiment with cows or pigs or other animals, and it might well turn out that they have some such anticipation. If so, then I think that would make a difference to the argument that Scruton is trying to put elephants, forward. Elephants, of course, have also a very, very year-long uh, experience. Uh, with elephants, we do have, I think, uh, different kind of ev evidence about um, yeah, longer recollections. True. Um, Professor Singer, um, I, I look at... I look at labour migration, as I've um, talked to you earlier in the lecture, and do you think this concept of animal citizenship takes citizenship too far? Now, it's not a new concept. Canadian um, political philosopher, I think Will Klininka mentioned it um, in the Hart lecture two years ago, um, that when I, when I look at my research of temporary labour migration program, guest workers programs, um, guest workers are often called as second class citizens. And, um, you know, we take them into our societies within bounded political communities and we deny them a range of socio-economic, civil and political rights. Now, we bring domesticated animals into our society. If the claim to membership of a society is conceptualised as citizenship, which comes with a set of rights and responsibilities. Um, is it possible, and, and I'm interested in your view, whether uh, this could apply, and it would obviously feed into um, your arguments about giving equal consideration for similar interests um, of animals and human beings. So I take the example, I'm a dog lover. In fact, my dog had a passport, um, a, a pet passport. Some people might be familiar with that. Um, Say police dogs, for example. So they work alongside human beings. And I'm also a labor rights person. So shouldn't police dogs also be given the same workers' rights? For example, right to rest. And you know, when they retire, they should also get a pension. Uh, well, I think they're, they're, you know, you've raised a host of interesting questions. Um, so on the question of citizenship. Um, you're right, Will Kimlicker, the Canadian philosopher who's pushing this, he actually has a book that you might like to see called Zoopolis, um, which uh, is promoting this idea. Um, clearly, if animals were to be citizens, they would have to have human beings as their representatives, um, because they can't, you know, citizens get to vote uh, and influence decisions, Animals are not capable of voting, um, so you would need to have advocates for them. Maybe you would think that they ought to have some voice in legislative decisions. Um, I could certainly agree with that. Uh, are they, does it make sense to regard them as citizens? I'm, I'm less sure about that. Um, uh, and the question would be then, so, <coughs> If you count each one, the, the, number of, the number of chickens in most countries would vastly outweigh the number of humans. Um, so does that mean that they get more votes or that their representatives get more votes? I mean, I, I, to be honest, I, Kimlicka seems to think that this is a sort of a political idea that should be pushed as an alternative to using ethical arguments. But unless you persuade people that the way we are presently treating animals is unethical, why would they accept an arrangement that, give, that gave animals uh, any significant weight in legislative decisions? Um, I don't think so. Um, just about briefly about the labour stuff, I certainly think that animals that work, and there are many animals that work, uh, ought to be uh, rested, and um, if they get to the point where they're old and they can't do their work properly, then yes, they should be given uh, comfortable lives for the remainder of that period. Can I ask you to keep your question really short, like within one minute, and only ask one question? Because uh, and I'll try to keep my answers shorter too. Uh, so. uh, could I go back to your farm example, um, which is the farmer saying that, well, um, if I wasn't able to sell them, then I couldn't maintain the farm and I couldn't maintain their lives. I think there's a broader uh, speciesism issue there. It, it, is it your assumption 
that if no one ate meat, the commercial production of, a, of uh, animals stopped completely, that those beautiful spotted cows would just somehow live a natural life and run off to the fields and kind of do their thing? Or would their species come to an end? And isn't, doesn't that uh, register as, as an ethical problem? Um. I don't think their species would come to an end because I think once they started to get rare, we would find that people would keep a few of them, um, just as we have with draft horses, for example, right? I mean, we don't use horses as basically, well, at least certainly not in Western societies, I guess there's some parts of the world where we do, but we don't use them uh, to pull carts and wagons um, anymore. But the kinds of breeds of horses, the Clydesdales and so on, the heavy horses, um, uh, there's vastly diminished numbers of them from what they used to be in the 19th century, but they've not become extinct because there are horse fanciers and people who keep them. I imagine the same would happen with cows as much uh, as well. But there would be many fewer of them, and the point of the argument is to say there would therefore be fewer cows enjoying the kind of good life you saw in the slide. Thank you for raising your question. I just wanted to add a lot. A lot of people don't realize in the poultry industry hatch, uh, that they separate the female and male chicks and then they get um, onto this conveyor belt and they get into the turbines and killed immediately because the male chicken roosters are basically uh, useless in the whole poultry industry. So that's Yeah, certainly. Uh, you're right. Um, yeah, so, so if you have a laying breed, an egg-laying breed, uh, the males are useless, they don't gain weight in the way that the poultry breed gains weight and they will be killed immediately. Um, you could also, it's also true that the hens don't live out a natural lifespan either. Their, um, their, later, their rate of laying eggs will start to drop off after about a year. And even though their lifespan, they could easily live, say, seven years, they will be sent to slaughter once they're not laying at a high enough rate too. Professor uh, Yi. Thank you for your talk. I guess uh, the question's about the how to encourage people to eat less meat. Uh, I'm from the public health. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, eating excess consumption of meat has some negative effects on the health. But we don't really consider eating meat as an unhealthy behavior in the public health, so we don't really discourage people not to eat. We're saying that eat more vegetable or fruit, so make a, a balance in terms of the consumption. So, I mean, you're looking at here that eating meat has caused the climate change, but we don't really see any kind of public health ethic arguments about why we shouldn't eat meat. So, uh, I mean, what do you think about any kind of, what other justification other than ethical way to kind of persuade the public health professional or health uh, medical professional to encourage people to not eat meat? Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not really a health specialist. Uh, so it's, I mean, I've looked at some of this literature um, and my, you know, I guess fairly amateur kind of opinion is that there are pretty good health reasons for not eating red meat, um, but that the evidence that it's harmful to eat uh, chicken or fish um, is much weaker, or perhaps, uh, certainly in the case of fish, not really uh, existing at all. So I think it would be good to discourage people for health grounds from eating red meat. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I guess you could do that in the way that we, you could do that by education. Um, uh, and that would also have a big, big effect on climate change. Um, the, in the United States, there's currently a debate going on about the annual this panel that makes recommendations about what people should eat. And in the draft that has been released for the first time, they do talk about the climate change implications of eating um, meat, uh, beef in particular. And it will be interesting to see whether the, the sort of the cattle industry, of course, now is lobbying strongly against that. It will be interesting to see whether that recommendation survives into the final version or not. Um, but I think that would be good, and I think you could even put a tax on meat as, you know, there's a tax on cigarettes because they're unhealthy in many countries. I think you could do the same, particularly for red meat. Um, Professor Lisa? I just wanted to return to the Roger Scruton's uh, kind of issue. Uh, Don Marquis, of course, has argued that, that even if 
uh, an individual doesn't have an interest or take an interest in something, uh, they might it might still be in their interest to, um, to f for some future good. So yeah. a suicidal teenager, right, who doesn't realize that, that, that it, it might not care about living longer, it's still in that individual's interest to live. Why not say the same thing about um, the cows? Oh, I think you can say the same thing about the cows. Um, if they will have a good life, they do have an, an interest in continuing to live uh, in the sense that they will continue to enjoy that life. But the question is whether you can compensate for the loss of that interest in the cow that is killed by the fact that there will then be another cow who will also have a good life. Now, on Don Marquis's view, I think his answer is you can't, that it's something that is specific to an existing being. Um, and, of course, he uses that argument uh, to suggest that when abortion kills a, a, a fetus that would have a good life, it's done a wrong, and he's not moved by the fact that uh, you know, the woman might have another child later on. So uh, if, if, that's, if you think that there's only interests that like, stick to existing beings and uh, a mere potential being brought into existence can never compensate for that, then you're right. Then that would be an argument against, um, against the uh, kind of replaceability of cows. Um, yeah, that gentleman. Uh, I'd just like to take you back to sort of foundations. Uh, if many animals are predators and are fairly indiscriminate about who they prey upon and who they use, I, either we are no better than these animals because we could be indiscriminate and just please ourselves, or actually we can discriminate on how we're going to act. And if that's the case, then we're moral agents and we have moral values. And given our position in this earth, we have dominion, then are we not a bit like gods? We have moral agency, moral values, and we have power. And therefore, the way we treat the world has got to be really quite unique. Oh, I think everything that you said is, is true. Um, but I don't see that this shows that uh, we're justified in disregarding or giving less weight to the interests of animals. I mean, I think that was Kant's mistake. When it, you weren't saying that. No, I wasn't saying that. Oh. I was putting our position relative to other animals. Yeah. I, look, I, I mean, we're obviously different. I've never suggested that we were not different um, from animals in a variety of ways. And the capacity for moral agency is, I think, one of those differences. I mean, you could get into arguments about whether chimpanzees maybe have some capacity for moral agency equivalent to that of... Uh, you know, maybe a three-year-old child. And obviously, you can debate whether a three-year-old child is a moral agent or not. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but undoubtedly, the, the moral agency of a normal human adult is uh, vastly greater than that of any non-human animal, uh, as far as we're aware. So, so yes, we're different. I, I've never denied that we're different. Um, what I've denied is that that difference justifies us in disregarding the interests of the moral patients, if you like, the ones who are not moral agents but are still capable of suffering. No, no, does not that head towards utilitarianism then? Uh, yes, I'm happy to head towards utilitarianism. I have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, Professor Chow? Uh, if we accept the principle of equal consideration of interest to all animals, and if you take this principle seriously, does it imply that we have a moral duty that we should never kill or eat any other animals if they do not bring any harm to us. This is uh, the natural conclusion following your principle. Well, this is what I've, I've left somewhat open, right? This question of whether, whether it follows that we should never kill animals except in real self-defense or something like that. Um, and I think that we have had a couple of suggestions from the questions. Uh, 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 from Danny there and uh, um, Professor Litzer there, that uh, uh, there are reasons for thinking, for drawing that conclusion that you drew. I was trying to suggest that um, there would be another possible position. Um, it has, you know, like many positions in philosophy, it has some pluses and some uh, disadvantages, some objections to it, which, which might allow the killing of animals that have good lives and are replaced by others. But... Uh, yeah, it's certainly, you could, you could draw the implication that you uh, concluded. 
We have only five more minutes. Uh, this gentleman. Hi, Professor Singer. Um, I have a question that um, there recently there seems to be some progress about um, producing meat in laboratory, la mm -hmm. labor laboratory. Um, it, does that, is that more ethical if, if we eat meat um, from a laboratory? And if so, then I try to imagine like if we start to make dog meat or like human meat or other kind of you meat, eat. then, but, but that, that still seem, seems to be a bit un unethical. What, what do you think about it? Yeah, look, I mean, if, if, if you take a single cell um, and you do that to produce the flesh of the animal whose cell was taken, <clears throat> there is no sentient being who is harmed by that. And if it is also ecologically, uh, environmentally sustainable, uh, and it certainly does seem like it would be more sustainable than having living animals, uh, and if it's economical as well, um, I have no problem with it. Um, and indeed, you know, I would have no problem with uh, human meat either. In fact, the, uh, the director of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, a large American uh, animal organization, has said that she wants people to eat her after she dies. Um, <laughs> You know, basically indicating that she's a piece of meat too, um, and trying to break down the gulf that we have between humans and uh, and animals. And she would be quite happy to have her cells developed. I would be quite happy to give anyone a few cells if they wanted to cultivate them in the laboratory. Um, at, at the moment, it's just not economical, um, but maybe one day it will be. Uh, Professor Singer, uh, glad to see you again. Uh, you. Yeah, I, I saw you on Tuesday. I remember. Yeah. 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 Uh, recently, I've been thinking a lot about the is art problem postulated by David Hume, namely that you cannot derive an art from an is. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this? And what do you actually mean when you say that something is immoral or some act is morally wrong or unethical? Thank you. So the short answer is I agree with David Hume. I don't think that any series of is statements, of factual or descriptive statements, enable you to derive a normative statement or an, an odd statement. I think Hume is right about that. Um, but I think if you ask me what my, my current view is, and it has changed a bit over the years, I think that we can see some normative statements as self-evidently true. Um, and I think the idea, for example, that agony is bad is a self-evident normative truth. Um, but, you know, that's controversial among philosophers. A lot of philosophers would not agree with that. So, uh, and I myself wouldn't have agreed with that statement probably, uh, you know, a, a decade or two ago. I've somewhat shifted, and the book that Professor Lee mentioned that I, it's a co-authored book, uh, wrote about uh, the work of Henry Sidgwick, who was an objectivist. Uh, it's a book called The Point of View of the Universe. If you want to follow up with my current views on that issue, that's the book to look at. Okay, probably the final question. Uh, um, thank you. Can you um, I'm just curious about this confidence in uh, human beings as moral agents here. Okay, I hear um, people saying that you know, we are moral agents and then we are sort of better than animals. But common sense actually tells us that human beings can wipe out the rest of the world. Okay, by one click. Yeah, but, but okay. just, just so, so in that sense, okay, we may be potentially more destructive. Yeah, maybe. But, but to say that we're moral agents doesn't mean we're morally good agents, uh -huh. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 being a moral agent is having the capacity to act morally. Uh -huh. uh, we, may not, we may not use so, that capacity. So, so to follow that logic then, you know, that whether one is a moral agent or not will not actually make one of a higher status well i think as the gentleman said they're different status there are uh -huh. you know different different in respect that i think the point is we can make moral judgments about what humans do we can say they acted rightly or wrongly they're living ethically or they're not living ethically we can't say that of a very small child let's say a, i think we can't really say that of a two-year-old and i don't think we can say it of um, uh, a pig or a dog either that's the difference Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Singer, and also thank you all for coming to this public lecture.